Most people think Bitcoin is decentralized because Satoshi disappeared. They're wrong. Bitcoin has four pillars of decentralization. And right now, three companies hold $300 billion worth with two pillars completely broken. And these are the two that protect you. These people think they own Bitcoin. They just own permission and they don't even realize what they've surrendered. Here's which protections you've lost, why custodians want it that way, and what you can do about it today. But first, why did Satoshi have to disappear for any of this to work? In 2011, Bitcoin's creator, Satoshi Nakamoto, disappeared. No goodbye, no explanation, no forwarding address. Most people think this was random. It wasn't. This was the design. This is what makes Bitcoin different from everything tried before it and most of what's come since. Ethereum has Vitalik Buterin, Cardano has Charles Hoskinson, Solana has a foundation running things. Bitcoin has nobody. Satoshi's Bitcoin wallet, the one that's linked with mining the first blocks, has over a hundred billion dollars worth of Bitcoin sitting in it right now. One hundred billion dollars. And it hasn't moved, not once in 16 years. That's the level of commitment to decentralization we're talking about. Without Satoshi around, no one can change Bitcoin's direction. No government can pressure a CEO. No corporation can buy out the founder. No lawyer can serve papers on anyone. That's the foundation of Bitcoin. But it's not really what makes Bitcoin decentralized. There are four specific types of decentralization that build on it. And understanding them will show you exactly what you need to do to actually protect your Bitcoin. The first one gives you something no bank ever could, proof. When you bought Bitcoin on Coinbase, did you actually verify that they have it? Did you check the blockchain yourself? No, you just trusted them. That's the problem with not running a node. A node validates every single transaction and every single block independently. Think of it as Bitcoin's immune system. There are over 100,000 of these running all over the world right now. Anyone can run one. TC, the guy who I also do a podcast with, and also he's from the road to one Bitcoin, proved you can run a Bitcoin node on a Raspberry Pi for about 150 pounds, including the hard drive. But something happened to me personally that drove this home. I held Bitcoin on Coinbase for years. I thought I was being smart, you know, it's insured, it's regulated, it's safe. Then one day I tried to withdraw it to my own wallet. Your account has been flagged for review. How long do you think it took me to access my Bitcoin? 30 days. I couldn't access my own money. I had to fill out forms, submit documents, wait for some compliance person to decide if I was allowed to have my own Bitcoin. That's when it hit me. I didn't own Bitcoin. I owned permission to access Bitcoin. Huge difference. When you hold Bitcoin on an exchange or in an ETF, you're not running a node because there's no point. You're trusting someone else to validate for you. You're trusting that they're actually holding the Bitcoin they say they are. And that trust, that's the exact thing that Bitcoin was designed to eliminate. I finally got my node running properly recently and I'll show you how I did this soon. So that's the first type, node decentralization. But the second type is what saved Bitcoin when the world's biggest economy tried to kill it overnight. In 2021, China banned Bitcoin mining. Everyone panicked. China controls most of the Bitcoin's hash rate. This is the end. I actually remember seeing this price action live and thinking there is no way Bitcoin recovers from this. Within six months, the mining had redistributed across dozens of countries. Bitcoin didn't even blink. That's mining decentralization in action. Bitcoin's governance system holds an election every 10 minutes. That election decides which version of the blockchain is the valid one. And right now, Bitcoin's mining is spread across multiple continents. After that China ban, the hash rate scattered to the US, to Kazakhstan, to Canada, to countries all over the world. Now, there is some concentration risk here. Five pools make up over 90% of the hash rate. Large mining pools could theoretically combine to attack the network by controlling over 51%. But here's what they don't. If you cheat Bitcoin, you only cheat yourself. The economic incentives are so perfectly aligned that attacking the network costs you more than just playing fair. If they did double spend their Bitcoin, the price tanks and all their mining equipment becomes worthless. That is mining decentralization. It keeps the election fair every 10 minutes. But the third type is why Bitcoin moves so slowly and why that's actually its greatest strength. When Ethereum wants to make a change, the Ethereum Foundation coordinates it and the community follows. 
When Solana's network goes down, the foundation reboots it. When Bitcoin had the scaling debate for three years, people thought it was broken. But here's what actually happened. Bitcoin has multiple client implementations running the same protocol, like different browsers all reading the same websites. Multiple teams, multiple code bases, no single point of failure. And to change the rules, you need overwhelming agreement from everyone. Miners, nodes, developers, businesses. Usually 90 to 95% consensus or nothing changes. Now, some people look at this and say Bitcoin is too slow to innovate. But during those three years people called failure, frustration bred innovation. While everyone argued, developers built the Lightning Network, a way to process millions of transactions without bloating the blockchain and doing it almost at the speed of light for basically free. The failure to quickly agree actually proved Bitcoin's strength. No dictator could force a bad decision. Think of it like this. Ethereum is like a sports car where this can happen. Bitcoin is a massive ship with 100,000 captains who all have to agree on the direction. It moves slower, but good luck hijacking that. That's development decentralization. But the fourth type is the most misunderstood and it's the one most people think they have, but don't. Bitcoin whales control everything. I see this headline almost every other week. Here's why that's wrong. Having more Bitcoin doesn't give you any more control of the network. Let me say that again. Owning more Bitcoin gives you no more control. Bitcoin isn't like traditional stocks where more shares equal more votes. Your balance gives you zero protocol control. In mining, votes come from computing power, not from Bitcoin balance. In node operation, same thing. One node equals full validation power. A whale with 10,000 Bitcoin has exactly the same ability to change Bitcoin's rules as someone with 0.0001 Bitcoin which is to say none. But here's the critical part most people miss. If you don't control your keys, you don't have Bitcoin, you have an IOU. When your Bitcoin sits on an exchange or in an ETF, the custodian holds the power, not you. And when billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin gets concentrated in a few custodians hands, that breaks wealth decentralization. I also break down whale concentration myths in another video, link below. Which brings me to the threat that most people don't even see. So now you understand all four types of decentralization, here's the problem. Three companies custody most of their Bitcoin in ETFs and exchanges. Coinbase, Binance and Fidelity. If a government wanted to seize that Bitcoin, they wouldn't need to attack 100,000 nodes spread across 100 countries. They just need to knock on three doors. And the custodians? they profit from this. Every Bitcoin in their vault generates custody fees, lending revenue and regulatory approval. Self-custody eliminates all of that. They need you dependent on them. It is their entire business model. Billions of dollars in Bitcoin sitting in centralized vaults. People thinking they're getting exposure to Bitcoin, but they're not running nodes. They're not controlling the keys. Custodians are. Look, I get it, it's convenient, it's easy, it's regulated, it's tax efficient, but it completely breaks the decentralization model. So here's what's actually happening if you hold Bitcoin through an ETF or exchange. Mining decentralization still works. Development decentralization still works. No decentralization is broken. You're not validating anything. And wealth decentralization is broken. Custodians control it all. So you're only getting two out of the four decentralization pillars. But here's why that is catastrophic. The two that break are the only two that protect you. Mining and development protect the network. Nodes and custody protect your Bitcoin. Lose those two and you're just back to trusting banks. So what do we actually need to do? Start with self-custody. Get a hardware wallet to control your own keys, non-negotiable. Then run a node and validate transactions yourself if you can. Look, I'm not great with this techie stuff and I kept putting this off for ages. I had a ledger with security issues, downloaded node software, but I never actually used it, never moved Bitcoin through it. It just sat there because I didn't really understand what I was doing. Then I jumped on a free 30 minute call with the Bitcoin way and that call changed everything. They walked me through what hardware I needed, how to set it up and why each step mattered one on one, no pressure. Now I can move my Bitcoin without anyone's permission and verify the blockchain myself. Nobody can freeze my account or make me wait 30 days or even longer. This is a skill I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. 
and it was worth figuring out properly the first time instead of risking generational wealth on guesswork. I went with the Start9 node 5% discount in the link below. Plus you can get a free 30 minute call with the Bitcoin way in the link in the description if you need help too. Bitcoin's decentralization isn't just a feature, it's the foundation of everything else. And now you know how to protect it. Jeff Booth says this repeatedly, as long as Bitcoin stays decentralized and secure, it will reprice the entire system. Let me know if you've already done this and how you did it, because here's what happens to everyone else. They keep their Bitcoin on Coinbase, keep buying the ETF, keep trusting custodians, then one day they try to withdraw it and see your account is under review. And next time, it may not only be 30 days that you, until you can get it back. Don't let that be you. So now you understand Bitcoin's decentralization, but that raises an even bigger question. If Bitcoin is completely open source, if any hacker on earth can read every line of code right now, why hasn't it been hacked in 16 years? Better yet, why have thousands of attempts to copy Bitcoin all failed? To see why, you need to watch this video next. Because being open isn't Bitcoin's weakness, it's its superpower.